Hello and welcome to our broadcast. So glad you could join me today. My name is Larry Hutton. Glad to have you with me. Uh, this is Limitless Life where we discuss all the wonderful good things about our redemption, about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. He's alive, he's well, he's not some fake being, he's not some dead person in the grave like all the other religions serve dead gods. We serve a living, living, risen Jesus and he's alive and well and he wants to do good things in your life. Uh, he wants to heal your body if you need healing. He wants to set you free financially if you're bound by debt and lack. He, he wants to set you free emotionally if you have problems with bad temper anger or with stress or with worry or depression or discouragement or guilt or shame. He wants you set free. That's the Jesus we're talking about here. We're not talking religion. We're talking a relationship. And this is real, the real deal. This is the real thing. And so that's why limitless life, the lim uh, heaven is the limit. We take the limits off. Man, when you walk with Jesus, all your sins are wiped away when you accept him. Uh, all your sickness uh, can be totally healed because he bore it on the cross. All your, every curse that can come against you in life, Jesus bore it on the cross so you could live like the first Adam did before sin. The last Adam, who is Jesus, took our sin. The first Adam brought sin into man's life, into humanity. And so the last Adam, he, he eradicated sin. He did away with it, or at least the effects of it. He bore our sins so that now if you sin, you can still be set free because of what he already did. You don't have to keep sinning, in other words. You can be set free and not have to yield to it anymore because you've become righteous. When you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, He makes you right before you do one right thing. So it's not your right act or actions that got you saved. By grace are you saved through faith. So your faith is in what Jesus did. So that's what we're all about on this program. We're, we want God's will from heaven to be done on earth. That's what Jesus said. Uh, 1 John 2, 6, we can walk on the earth even as Jesus did. And he walked free from sin, free from sickness, free from disease until he went to the cross when he went there uh, in place of you and me. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're doing a series and I have actually titled this series, Dr. Jesus is in the house. This is our 20th lesson. So we've done 19 lessons before this one uh, about Dr. Jesus. Dr. Jesus does not practice medicine. He is perfect in his medicine and in his administered ministration of medicine. His um, his medicine that he administers as the great physician has no side effects, or I should say has great side effects. <laughs> yeah, they'll heal your body, bring you peace, bring you joy, bring you happiness, bring you contentment, bring all kinds of things that when he, when he gives you this medicine of his word, his word is medicine to all our flesh. Uh, so we're talking about Dr. Jesus in the house, and, and that means he wants you healthy. He wants you whole in your physical body. And so we're going to, we're going to continue this. I think I'll probably go another week as well. Maybe even two more weeks. Who knows? We'll just see how the, how I feel impressed of the spirit of God in me. But there's so much to learn about this and there's so much wrong teaching that has been taught about sickness and disease. And I, I even hear even recent times preachers that don't know, they've never learned what the Bible said. They, they've gone to some uh, place where they learned what they learned about uh, the Bible. And so they get up and they teach, uh, they teach a lot of good doctrine, but then they teach false doctrine when it comes to sickness and disease. They say it's from God and that God uses it for purposes and da 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 da, -da. And they, most of them stay in the old covenant. They don't come over in the new covenant where Jesus is the same today as when he walked the earth. Today, when he walked the earth, he's the same today as when he walked the earth. When he walked the earth, he never turned one single sick person down, never told them it wasn't God's will for them, never told them they had to wait a while, never told them that they weren't good enough, never told them that God put this on to teach humble or get their attention, never told them this was, well, this sickness is a blessing in disguise. Oh, go wash your hog, please. <laughs> Brother Larry, what do you mean go wash your hog? Well, haven't you heard the term hogwash? <laughs> Instead of saying hogwash to that false doctrine about sickness is a blessing in disguise, just go wash your hog. <laughs> no, um, 
Remember what we were looking at last program, as a matter of fact, when we were uh, in this series, the program number 19, um, is in Luke 13, uh, this woman who uh, was bowed, bowed over together. Remember the Bible said she was bowed over. Like, in other words, she had some kind of curvature of the spine, scoliosis, whatever, bad, some bad disease. Anyway, she couldn't even stand up straight. She was so curved. And she had it 18 years. And remember what Jesus said to her in the uh, 16th verse, Luke 13, 16. He said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from this bond or bondage on the Sabbath day? So I thought, now Jesus set the record straight right there. If somebody says, well, sickness is a blessing in disguise. That is not what Jesus said. And he only said, come on now, what he heard his father say. Hmm. And so when he said, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan hath bound. So he called sickness satanic bondage. And then he went on to say, be loose from this bondage. So he calls sickness satanic bondage. He calls sickness bondage, not a blessing in disguise. It's not a blessing, it's bondage. And God wants you and I free from that bondage. In fact, uh, you know, God, if you go to Deuteronomy 28 and go through all of the curses listed, you find out every single sickness and disease known or unknown to mankind is called a curse. So God actually calls sickness and disease a curse, not a blessing in disguise, a curse. Jesus, in that passage in Luke that we were looking at on the, in the 19th program, calls it bondage. And then if you go over to Acts chapter 10, verse 38, where the Holy Ghost is inspiring man to write it. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing, 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 listen, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Holy Ghost calls sickness satanic oppression. God calls it a curse. Jesus calls it bondage. Holy Ghost calls it oppression. What do you call it? You better get your, your, your mind and your uh, heart hooked up with what God said. God does not call sickness a blessing. It is not a blessing in disguise. And if anybody ever makes that statement, that is false doctrine. That is what the Bible calls doctrines of devils because it is of the devil. The devil wants us to believe that. Because if we actually believe, all right, I'm sick and, and I don't understand why God's doing this and God's allowing this and I'm actually believing it's a blessing. Somehow it's a blessing. I don't understand. Then I'm not going to resist it. If I think it's from God, I'm not going to resist sickness. In fact, I should be praying, God, make me sicker so I can be more blessed. Come on. I mean, if it's really a blessing and you really believe that, and if the preacher that says it really believes that, I'd like to hear them pray the next time they get sick. God, make me sicker. I want to be more blessed. I've never heard anybody say that. That's because nobody likes sickness and disease, and that's because that's the way God created us. He didn't create us to be sick. He created us to be well in our physical bodies. So sickness and disease is not a blessing, it's a curse. Anyway, last program, in the 19th program, I told you at the end of that program that I was going to show you and I'm probably going to do it this program and next program. But I wanted to show you how you, as a child of God, if you're born again, you can operate great faith. You don't have to wait many years until you become some great Christian like, you know, your famous preachers that you follow after something and, and you think they have great faith, but you can't operate in that great of faith. No, you can operate in great faith right away as a Christian. In fact, I'm going to show you somebody, a couple of people that operated in great faith before they even became children of God. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, and we'll, we'll go to verse 21. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21. This is, this is the story about the uh, sinner lady, the woman of Canaan, Syrophoenician, a Greek lady anyway. She wasn't an Israelite. She wasn't a child of God. So she was a sinner and she has a daughter that had devils and, and so she needs 
her devil delivered and she needs her daughter healed and so she's come to Jesus. So we're going to pick it up. This is also found in Mark's gospel, the seventh chapter. In fact, it's the seventh chapter in the 26th verse that lets us know she's a Greek and that she's Syrophoenician. Here in Matthew, when you read it, all it says in verse 22 is that she's a woman of Canaan. So if you put Mark and this together, you, you find out she's a Greek lady. Uh, her nationality is, is uh, Syrophoenician. Um, so let's pick it up here in verse 21 of Matthew 15. Then Jesus went from where he was, departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Verse 27, She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed. So now once again we're seeing healing take place when demons have to flee. So we see demons. She was severely demon possessed. So demon possession was behind the sickness. In other words, they were possessing her with sickness. It wasn't that she was seeing all kinds of weird demonstrations of demonic powers. These demons were making her sick. And so she was sick, but notice verse 28 says, and her daughter was healed that very hour. So that's good. All right, so let's go back to verse 22. Verse 22, this woman uh, came from Canaan, uh, from that region. And I want you to understand when I say she was a sinner, uh, just a moment ago, I want you to see something. Hold your place here and let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see the plight, if you will, or the condition, um, um, the lack of hope that somebody has if they were not a child of God. Let me just show you here in Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians 2, 11. We'll read verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision. This was everybody referring to everybody that was not Jewish. They were called the circumcision, right? So the uncircumcision were everybody that was outside uh, being a child of God, uh, part of the children of Israel. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. In other words, the Jews called you uncircumcision. Uh, and they were, they were circumcision made in the flesh by hands, Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Whoa. So you're a Gentile uncircumcised Gentile, just like that uncircumcised Philistine that David killed. But now we're in the new covenant, better covenant established on better promises and God so loved the world so everybody can get in. But that time you were without Christ. You were alien from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope hmm, without God in the world. So, so this woman, this woman of Canaan, or as Mark 7, 26 says, this, this Greek woman, this Syrophoenician woman, she's a pagan. Uh, she's without Christ, here it says in Ephesians. She's alienated from Israel. Uh, she has no connection whatsoever to God's covenant. She has no hope. And she's without God. She may have false gods in her life because the Gentiles did, but she's without God, a true and living God, a real God. So this woman, for her to come, I mean, in verse 22, we're going to go back, back here now. 
Verse 22, Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region. Matthew 15, 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried to him, having, uh, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. For her to come so shows us that she had to have heard some, some startling things that maybe other Gentiles had not heard. What, what was it that she heard? Well, obviously for her to come and call out on him as Lord, she's heard about him being a master, a rabbi. She's heard about him being a, a savior, a, a deliverer, uh, excuse me, a, um, a miracle worker, um, whatever. She's, she's heard some major things for her to come and say, Lord, and then son of David, so she's heard some things about the lineage that he's come from. So, you know, somehow when she heard some things, maybe she went and studied and did some more studies and found out some things. I don't know. But somehow she heard enough that made her realize there's my answer. Jesus is my answer. I'm going to go get my answer because nobody can help me. I'm sure she'd been to the exorcist and all the magicians and soothsayers and sorcerers and all the, those kind of people. I'm sure she'd probably tried all the stuff that the, the heathen try, the medicines and the doctors and the witch doctors and everything. She'd been to all that, I'm sure, but no help, nothing. And so when she heard about Jesus, just by her actions, she heard some things that gave her hope. Even though from a natural standpoint, she was without hope, without God, cutting alien from the covenants of promise. She, she was without God in her life. So she had heard some, thing, some, th some things about Jesus. And so she comes and says, look what she says in verse 22, have mercy on me. Boy, when you call out on the mercy of God, you're calling out on everything. Do you remember when blind Bartimaeus called on the mercy of God and Jesus asked him what he wanted, which, you know, kind of probably was weird to the people standing around as disciples and other people. They thought, well, Jesus, why are you asking this blind guy who's, who's calling out for you for healing or for, for mercy? Why are you asking him, what do you want? Because that's what he asked blind Bartimaeus. What do you want? What do you want? But the reason he asked him is because blind Bartimaeus didn't say, Jesus, thou son of David, heal my eyes. He didn't say that. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy mercy on me. So Jesus comes back and says, okay, blind Bartimaeus, what do you want? Because my mercy contains it all. You need, you need healing for the eyes? Okay, that, that's contained in my mercy. Uh, do you need um, uh, financial blessings? Because you've been begging and you need that. So that's part of my mercy. And, and, and what about all those sores you got from laying around and sitting around begging? Do you, you want me to heal those too? Because you just called on my mercy. What do you want, blind Bartimaeus? <laughs> you called on my mercy. And that's what this woman does here. She, she called on the mercy. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. And then called her Lord, which shows me something uh, about uh, submission. She was submitting to him rather than submitting to all the false gods, the pagan gods that she had probably worshipped all her life and got her nowhere except that, except all of those demons and devils that are associated with other, other religions. They had uh, taken advantage of her daughter and made her sick and diseased kind of reminds me of that guy in Mark chapter 9 where the, where the man comes to Jesus. Now, he was an Israelite. He comes to Jesus and Jesus, uh, my son's grievously possessed, possessed of devils and devils throw him into the water trying to drown him to death. They throw him into the fire trying to burn him to death. Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion. There's mercy. Same, same word as mercy. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus turned around and said, well, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Why did he say all things? Why didn't he just say this one thing you need? You need your, your son delivered from these demons and, and not uh, being thrown into fire anymore and into the waters to destroy him anymore? He didn't say that. He said, you called on my mercy, so if you can believe, all things. Now, you've called on the mercy, so every single thing you ever need is contained in the mercy of God. Wow. So she calls him Lord, which shows submission that's the first place of great faith. You want to operate in great faith, you have to submit and then not take no for an answer. 
you got to get to the place where, okay, you know, even if it seems like God's saying no, and even if it seems like, uh, uh, no, I'm not taking no for an answer because I need healing. I need deliverance for me or my daughter, my son, whatever. Uh, bless God, I'm not taking no for an answer. Jesus, you are no respecter of persons. If you've done it for one, then you have to do it for me. Amen. That, that's the kind of faith you gotta, you've got to come to. You, just because it's been done for somebody else, you don't stop and say, boy, I sure wish God would do it for me. No, bless God, you know God will do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. And that's the first uh, attribute of great faith. That's the first place you've got to come to. Submit to him as Lord. In fact, we'll look at another example. I don't know if we'll get it to it next program or whatever, but soon we'll look at another example of that uh, centurion where he did the same thing. He just said, you just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Just that's all I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to your word as the final authority. So submission to Jesus as Lord, Lord of your body, Lord of your money, Lord of whatever, you got to submit to him as Lord, not just Savior, but Lord. All right. So look what happens after he calls on her. Let's go to the next verse, verse 23. He answered. Now Jesus answered no, he didn't answer, Brother Larry, exactly. Notice what it says. He answered her, not a word. I kind of like the way it's phrased there because I think he really did answer, not, not verbally. And I don't even think he gave her I answers. I think he's really, we'll get to it here in a minute, but I think he's really given her the answer. You know, kind of like seek and you shall, uh-huh. Knock. Well, you don't just knock and then go walk away. Man, if somebody doesn't answer, you knock again. <laughs> knock and you shall, the door shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. Right? I think, I think he did answer her by not answering her, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. In other words, he's pulling this great faith out. He knows she's not going to turn away and go away. And not if she wants this. If she wants this bad enough, faith doesn't just try one time. Faith isn't about trying. Faith is doing. And if you go on, read the story, she had great faith. He said, this is great. Woman, great is thy faith. We read it, right? So we know she has great faith. So he's pulling that faith out of her. He's, he's knowing that uh, I got to, I got to get her, keep her acting in faith because uh, there, there's purpose. There's a reason. Watch what he goes on to say. He answered her not a word and his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries after us. Now that gives us insight as to what she did after she turned to Jesus and Jesus didn't answer her. It says, and his disciples came. Well, that means they weren't standing next to Jesus when she came to him and cried out, mercy, have mercy on me, my son, son, uh, daughter's grievously vexed of a devil. They must not have been standing there. Because then when she turns from Jesus after he didn't answer and goes to her disciples, then it says his disciples came. So they must have been standing off in a, some distance or somewhere away when she came to Jesus the first time. And after Jesus didn't answer her, she didn't quit even though she had strike one against her. I mean, she could have gotten all mad when he didn't answer her. Look, it said he answered her not a word. He didn't answer her. Now, like I said, he really, he was giving her the answer, I believe, by not answering her. And, and we'll get into that in a minute. But why didn't he answer her? Well, notice what she did. She didn't quit. She didn't give up. See, faith Faith, just because you don't seem to get an answer, faith doesn't shut down and say, oh, well, I guess that doesn't work. <laughs> no, bless God, faith continues to press into what's available by the grace of God. And bless God, you call on the mercy of God, all of God's grace is available. And so she pressed in further. She went to the disciples and she asked the disciples, disciples, come on, uh, you can help me. Uh, I've, I've heard about you guys too. You've been traveling and you've been doing this and that and, and all these things that you're doing like him. And so you're his followers. Come on, help me out. And I imagine when it, when the disciples, you know, in verse 23, his disciples came and said, Jesus, send her away for she cries after us. Her cry must have been similar. Now they would, she wouldn't have said you disciples, son of David. She wouldn't have said that, but evidently her cries were Come on, guys, you're with him. You're representing him. I need 
healing and deliverance for my daughter. She's sick and diseased. Demons are possessing her. So come on, help me out. Come on. So she must have been serious. She must have not take, taken that, that offense that she could have taken. Could she have gotten offended when Jesus didn't answer? She could have gone, well, bless God, if that top dog preacher won't even talk to me when I talk to him, forget you, I'm going home. And if she'd have done that, she'd have gotten her feelings hurt and got offended, taken offense, bless God, she'd have gone home without her deliverance for her daughter. So you don't quit, you don't take offense, you don't give up if you op want to operate in great faith. If you want the grace of God flowing, you better stay in faith. And I'm going I'm to be showing you, we won't get into this program, I'll finish this next program. But if you stay in great faith, great faith is really nothing more than simple childlike faith. I'm going to prove to you in this passage that great faith is not quantity, but quality. Not a quantitative thing of, well, if, if I just hear and hear and hear and confess and confess and confess and believe and believe and believe and wait and wait and wait and, and try and try, and finally I'll get it someday because I'll, I'll be a person of great faith like so-and-so. No, no, great faith is a quality decision, and you can make it anytime, anywhere, for anything and operate great faith. I'll show you that next program. We'll get into it. We're out of time again. So thank you again for joining us. We're going to get right back into this. Dr. Jesus is in the house and he lives in you in that house that you're living in, that, that body you live in, the house of God. Yeah, he's living right there with you. And he's ready to administer the, the medicine of God from heaven that'll make you whole and heal you. But you got to draw it out with your faith. Love you. Call you blessed. We'll see you next time. Have a Jesus filled day. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. With your own words, you can release the power of life that will bring health to your body. God's healing grace is released through faith, and faith is released through what you say. Your healing is in your mouth. God wants you to be whole, well, and healthy. But if you have not heard his word on it, how can you have faith to call on him as your healer? These 52 Declare It cards have a healing scripture from God's word on one side and a corresponding declaration of faith, which you can speak about yourself on the other. Hearing God's word concerning your healing will build your faith to walk through life in complete confidence that every sickness or disease that ever attacks you must depart. To order your prescription for health declare it cards, go to larryhutton.org or call us at 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org or you can call 888-887-WORD.